Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. I figured I had to do this when you did it, and I'm taller, so I, when you did it, Chris. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure. I met Dana five years ago in a taxi drive, by coincidence, going to the airport in Tel Aviv. And here, I've been here every year since then, working on amazing things with Dana and Rebuilding Alliance. So I'm, uh, as, as uh, Ori said, I'm here to introduce my professor, but before I do this, I want to acknowledge a special guest, guest here, so many special people, but I want to acknowledge uh, Dina Takruri here, American-Palestinian journalist, she's a famous journalist, who's uh, been doing amazing videos on AJ+, most famous for AJ, her AJ+, videos, raising awareness on, through social media, changing a lot in the perspective and stereotypes here about Palestinians in America. So I was, I was very happy and delighted to see Dina here. So I wanted to, to make sure you guys know she's here. And uh, now I want to introduce the keynote speaker, my professor, Professor Sandy Tolan. Uh, many of you know him. He's a best-selling author. He's an award-winning journalist. Currently, he teaches at the Sco Annenberg School of Journalism uh, of Communication at the University of Southern California. He's a co-founder of Homeland Production, which has produced several inter international documentaries. Uh, he's best known for his coverage for uh, stories about land conflicts, racial issues, and global economy. He's very interested in Israel and Palestine and reported frequently about Israel and Palestine. Two of his most famous books, Palestinian, Palestinian, Palestinian uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the book now, Prisoner of the Stone, I'm sorry. And then his best seller, of course, The Lemon Tree, which gives uh, an image of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sandy Tolan. George and to all of you uh, I really appreciate being invited here and the opportunity to speak and share some thoughts and um, I want to thank Donna and, and Betsy Valdez who has been in touch with uh, I'll get a little bit closer I guess is that good okay um, and George for the introduction uh, I know it's moving on in the evening so I promise to not speak more than five hours so I promise to get you out of here before 2 a.m., okay? I think the Ubers are still running then, so. No, but seriously, what I wanna to do tonight, and, and Dory and others have mentioned this, is I think there's a shift going on. I agree that there's a shift going on. It, it's certainly not uh, one, just one direction, but, but we're seeing a change, and I wanna talk about that from the standpoint of someone who's looked and, and visited and, and spent time in Palestine and Israel uh, probably 20 trips over the last 25 years. But I want to talk a little bit about being in this country and changing the national conversation. It's something uh, in reframing that conversation. It, as a journalist, one question I always like to consider is, is what is the, the so-called master narrative? What's the uber narrative? And from whose perspective is that mer master narrative told? The ethical question that has gripped me for my entire career as a journalist is, as someone just mentioned recently, who gets to tell the story? Or if you prefer, whose story are we hearing? And what is the so-called truth according to our national conversation? Now, before I get to Israel-Palestine, a couple of, of relatively recent examples before we get to the main story. Recall the debate, actually there was very little debate in political settings or the media in the run-up to the Iraq war. What was the uber, the so-called master narrative then? It was, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, right? Repeated again and again and again, despite some doubts being expressed and aired from, for example, Hans Blix, director of the Atomic, International Atomic Energy Commission, whether there really were any WMDs. It was American power through repetition of that uber narrative that prevailed in an exploitation of a very fearful society and a cowed media. Even though Iraq has WMD was a lie, officials professed certainty. They, prof they, they exuded strength. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, the threat of the mushroom cloud, 
the threat to America. That combined with that fear post 9-11 and the exploitation that followed allowed a kind of herd mentality spearheaded by some truly awful journalism. New York Times Judith Miller just being one of the most egregious of many examples. But there the master narrative was Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Imagine if the narrative had been something different. Or we could talk about right now, the US-Mexico border. What is the master narrative, regardless of the events of the last 24 hours? We need to secure our borders. Never mind that the actual numbers of people crossing is at historic lows. Never mind that a huge majority of the people crossing pose no ex existential or security threat. Never mind that the vast majority of drugs come into the US from official ports of entry. But what if we were to reframe that story, to focus on those children, those mothers, to ask not only why they want to come here, but why did they leave their country? What was so horrible and frightening that they would risk rape and death and killer heat where hundreds of men, women, and children over the years have died in the desert to come here? If we focused on that, could we change the conversation? If we changed the Uber narrative, could we change the conversation? Now, maybe some of this resonates a little bit in your mind when it comes to Palestine, Israel, where, to me, one of the most overriding themes, of course, is also security. What is the uber narrative, the master narrative of Palestine, Israel, and the US? That Israel needs to be secure, right? I call this the Leon Uris narrative, as told in the mega best-selling novel, Exodus, a portrayal of Israel's heroic birth out of the ashes of the Holocaust. And that's the only real version of the story that is told again and again and again. And therefore, the conclusion is Israel needs to be secure. It needs to exist as a safe and secure place for the, for the Jews. Israel needs to be secure. Israel has a right to defend itself. And therefore, the Arabs, portrayed as malicious, sinister, or pathetic, the other, the boogeyman, when they're portrayed at all, have no place in this Leon Uris Exodus narrative. Now, of course, as everyone in this room, I'm sure, knows what it leaves out and what is so brilliantly told by my friends and colleagues here, uh, Ahlam and Andy, in, in, the, in the story, in the documentary of 1948, it's immense what is left out. It is so thoroughly, the Leon Uris nar narrative is so thoroughly one-sided and yet so dominant culturally, politically, and journalistically in the U.S. Journalistically, narratively, we need to shift away from the way the story is told. We need to change and transform the narrative. Transform it from security for Israel as the single dominant lens to a broader, more inclusive lens. How about to freedom? Freedom from confinement. For years, of course, pro-Palestine solidarity groups, BDS activists and others have used the term apartheid, to describe the situation on the ground. Even the Nobel Prize winner, Peace Prize winner, South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu used the comparison himself way back in 2002. To, many this, to, to this, many pro-Israel groups raise strong objections or argue specifics about the situation that they say don't compare. For, for myself, I personally prefer the comparison to the Jim Crow South because that goes deeper into the American DNA. And it's something we can all relate to, all understand. Civil rights, human rights, voting rights, confinement, cruelty, domination. Strangely, perhaps, I haven't gotten a lot of pushback on that. And here again, if you stick to the facts, which are plenty, it's hard to argue. Excuse me. How else do you explain, outside of a Jim Crow context or something similar, the story of Israeli soldiers in April 2015 near the West Bank town of Yatta, where dozens of locals were enjoying a swim in the community pool, Palestinians, when suddenly settlers arrived, accompanied by Israeli soldiers who ordered the Palestinians out of the pool so that the settlers could bathe in peace. Under threat of violence, the Palestinians complied the uninvited visitors descended into the cool water, untouched and unbothered by the native population. 
For those of you who know about areas A, B, and C, you might be especially interested to know that this was in area A. How else do you explain the story of a 10-year-old girl, Allah Shalalda, and if we could have the, ah, there's Allah. Uh, Allah Shalalda stopped at a flying checkpoint in the West Bank and forced to take out her violin and play a song for a soldier. For those of you who know the music of Palestine, the song she chose was El Hilwadi, the beautiful girl, about a penniless child whose mood is serene, for she has put her life in God's hands. With patience, the song says, change will come and all will be better. How else do you explain the story of Allah's fellow violinist, Tayeb, 10 years later, just last summer, when I interviewed him, hiding in the trunk of a car, he had told me, risking arrest in prison so that he could go into Jerusalem, into his beloved off-limits Jerusalem, to play in an orchestra, a Palestinian-led orchestra, for Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. We have the second slide there. Yeah, there's a, a not very good photo by yours truly. There's a reason I'm a writer and not a photographer. <laughs> How else do you understand the story of children and families in Gaza? The next one, please who are drinking water so contaminated, uh, so contaminated that this next, if you could show the next slide, this is the Nim Nim family in Gaza's Shati or beach refugee camp. 19 people living in three small rooms. And then if we could go to the next one. This is Mohammed Nim Nim, 15 year old, pushing wheelchair loaded with water, drugs toward, uh, water jugs toward the local mosque because the family can't drink the salty water, nor can they afford the water that comes around from the network of water trucks. The bad water has generated a sharp rise in infant mortality, anemia, diarrheal disease, typhoid fever, salmonella, stunting of children, and something called heartbreakingly blue baby syndrome. This is not a photo in Gaza, I was not able to get one, but this is what a baby with blue baby syndrome looks like. This is a humanitarian catastrophe in desperate need of attention. One eyewitness to this catastrophe who I spent a lot of time with is Dr. Mohammed Abu Samia. There's the doctor. Uh, and it was heartbreaking to go into this children's ward in Gaza this past summer. This is late July about six months ago. How else do you comprehend Hebron, where 1,500 soldiers protect, protect some 500 settlers in a city of 170,000 Palestinians, and where steel nets, like this one, rise above the old Arab market to protect vendors from the debris? Bottles, bags of feces, bags of urine, metal objects, plastic chairs that the settlers hurl down from above. And how else do you explain these images over time that document the increasing confinement? 1936, 1947, the partition plan, 1949, now we're down from a single Palestine under British rule to 55% uh, the, the Jewish state to now 22%, which is the West Bank, Gaza. Next one, please. And of course, then in 2005, some of the major settlements. And now, today, or roughly today, uh, where Palestine is like an archipelago of islands, and those gray areas are Area C under full Israeli military control. So you can look at these maps I'm sure everyone in this room has seen some version of that. But to me, in terms of telling the story, especially to people who don't know the story, they see these maps. <laughs> it tells another story, right? These next two images also tell another story. Women waiting to pray in Jerusalem. And the next one, men trying to go to work in the West Bank. This is where being a witness to what is happening on the ground can be so useful. Whether you're a human rights witness, a solidarity witness, a journalistic witness. Telling the story of what is happening on the ground, from the ground, with your own eyes, 
despite the obstacles, is vital. This is about shifting the frame, shifting the Uber narrative, reframing from security to freedom from confinement, from a nation under threat from a so-called hostile sea of Arabs. We don't have time to pick that apart and go, go into a long geopolitical discussion, but just six words, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt. But anyway, this so-called hostile sea of Arabs, shifting that narrative to a narrative about a people under subjugation by one of the world's most powerful armies, reframing with eyewitness and a dedication to facts, because the facts are plenty. The other big reframing, number two in my mind, is to rebut and transform the many bogus accusations familiar to, I'm sure, everyone in this room, the acquisitions of anti-Semitism. We all know, and many of this, including one of our honorees, Dr. Aham Mutasim, has experienced that charge, not as an accusation with a single shred of truth, but as a deeply cynical, politically motivated club to silence legitimate criticism of Israel. Or even in some cases, like the brilliant 1948 documentary produced by our award winners tonight, to silence a deeply probing, more interesting and revealing exploration of a tragic history. But we can't be silent. Not when important work, including by serious filmmakers, scholars, journalists, and others, comes under attack, as happened recently, as Dory mentioned at the very beginning of the evening in West Hollywood. That's when a local rabbi and devotee of APAC made spurious charges, cutting and pasting these bogus accusations from a shadowy, discredited blacklist website called Canary Mission, after, the city, after which the City Council of West Hollywood, supposedly a bastion of free expression, elected to remove the screening and panel discussion, including with you truly, from their calendar. So here's the reframing as about taking these bogus charges of anti-Semitism and casting them as something else, far more accurately as an attack on free expression, a stifling of constitutionally protected speech. Now, are there anti-Semites among pro-Palestinians? Just as there are anti-Semites in Georgia, Idaho, Nebraska, California, every state in the Union, not to mention across Israel, I mean across Europe? Well, leaving aside the definition of Semite, the answer is certainly, just as there are plenty of Israelis and pro-Israeli advocates, whatever their religion. And let's not forget that the extremist and pro-settlement Reverend John Hagee's Christians United for Israel is now the biggest pro-Israel lobby in the U.S., bigger than APAC. But there are plenty among the staunchest advocates of Israel who hate and advocate the subjugation of the Arabs, a.k.a. Palestinians. But determining the numbers of who hates more, even if it were possible, is not the point. Nor, of course, is it the point to diminish the increasing horrific and deadly incidents of anti-Semitism, like the attack on the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, which had nothing to do with Israel-Palestine, or the threats against Jewish organizations in the U.S. in 2017, including at the swimming pool, where my wonderful wife, Andrea, and I, our child, seven at the time, was taking swimming lessons. Well, it turned out those were the threats from a disturbed Israeli teenager. His threats were included in the estimated 60% rise in anti-Semitic incidents from 2016 to 2017. Additionally, cases of picketing of Jewish religious or cultural institutions for their support of Israel is counted among the 60% increase. But it's also worth pointing out that the anti-Muslim anti incidents in this country are also on the rise in even more disturbing proportions, by 83%, according to the Council on American-Islamic Relations. And again, in the case of Israel-Palestine, and more specifically for advocates of Palestinian rights, freedom of movement, meaningful statehood, justice, the charge of anti-Semitism is chiefly a political tactic. Anyone with a shred of doubt about that uh, should watch even just the first hour of The Lobby, Al Jazeera's undercover and up to now censored investigative report of APAC and affiliated organizations. Al Jazeera, as you may know, has yet to release the documentary, but the electronic intifada got a copy, and it is worth watching for sure, even again, as I say, just 
just the first hour. It shows beyond doubt how using the cudgel of anti-Semitism, in quotes, is a conscious and deliberate political strategy to silence legitimate criticism of Israel. And many of us essentially knew this already, but it is bracing to see it described in detail by the strategists themselves, part of a powerful and up to now effective new thought police. And with this knowledge, a long list of incidents can be considered, considered in a different light, some of which you've already heard about tonight and no doubt know about. The case of Mark Lamont Hill, fired by CNN for daring to suggest in a speech to the UN that the Holy Land would eventually become a single state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. Provocative? Yeah. And troubling to some, but after decades of Israeli settler colonization of the West Bank, after that finally undermined the so-called two-state solution, a single democratic state of Israelis and Palestinians is hardly an idea to be muzzled by the thought police. Then there's the case of civil rights and progressive legend and UCLA professor Angela Davis, who, by the way, I believe it's her 75th birthday today, um, whose award from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institution, uh, Institute, the Fred Shuttlesworth Award, was rescinded after members of the local Jewish community, among others, objected to giving the award to someone who had stood up so steadfastly for Palestinian rights. Just as troubling, the broad efforts to slap the anti-Semitic label on nonviolent, constitutionally protected calls to boycott Israeli institutions. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which has gained, of course, momentum in recent years, has prompted dozens of state laws and bills in Congress to impose civil and even criminal sanctions against groups that boycott Israeli products or institutions. And let's be clear that efforts like this have bipartisan support. Hillary Clinton's fawning letter about BDS to Democratic donor and Clinton Foundation bankroller, the Israeli-American Haim Saban, which is easily, easy to find online, is a perfect example of that. I've also ex uh, experienced occasional attacks, most curious to me by a group called Stand With Us, a group pronounced uh, in a pronounced way to the right of Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, whose former director, the Stand With Us former director, once said flat out that any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, any criticism. And that group tried to get The Lemon Tree, my book about the history of the Israeli-Palestinian tragedy, banned from public school libraries. I won't dignify their criticism with another sentence more. By framing this as a free speech issue, though, which is exactly what it is, we can change the narrative to show that this is not about anti-Semitism, but that, again, that is a tool to shut up critics of Israel. We need to reframe this to be, a, be about something rooted in the ideals of American culture and enshrined in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Because, of course it isn't anti-Semitic to speak about Allah, forced to play a song for a soldier at a military checkpoint in the occupied West Bank. Of course it isn't anti-Semitic to note that Tayeb was hiding in the trunk of a car 10 years later to play Beethoven's Ninth in the orchestra in his beloved Jerusalem, or the Nimnim -Nim family struggling to find safe, clean drinking water in Gaza, trying to stave off disease, or any American debating the merits of a boycott, say, of the Caterpillar Company, whose D9 militarized bulldozers have been used by the Israeli army to demolish many of the nearly 49,000 homes and other structures in the occupied territories since 1967. Homes, by the way, that groups like Rebuilding Alliance are helping to rebuild along with the lives of the families most affected. And of course it's not anti-Semitic to speak out about these things. And it's disingenuous, it's dishonest, it's just flat out wrong to say otherwise. In fact, we have a right, we have an obligation to be honest witnesses about what we see with our own eyes, to use our rights and our privileges to tell the truth as we see it. By refusing to be silent, by speaking up, we can make a difference. That's already happening, as, as others have already noted today. I don't know how often uh, you read the New York Times, but Michelle Goldberg has had some interesting work in recent months. And then came this, really, I think, a watershed piece by 
New York Times uh, opinion piece by Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow about African American incarceration, who wrote re recently that Israel, and I'm going to quote in just a moment, She wrote that Israel has grown more emboldened in its occupation of Palestinian territory and adopted some practices reminiscent of apartheid in South Africa and Jim Crow segregation in the US. As she continues, many civil rights activists and organizations have remained silent as well. Note the Fred Shuttleworth, uh, Shuttlesworth Award. Not because they lack concern or sympathy for the Palestinian people, but because they fear loss of funding from foundations and false charges of anti-Semitism. And she concludes, it seems the days when critiques of Zionism, the actions of the state of Israel can be written off as anti-Semitism are coming to an end. These are words, one of the most uh, striking things to me about this piece, uh, other than you know, what I just read you, was how honest she was about how she was silent. And she finally said, you know what, halas. <laughs> she didn't say that exactly, but you know what I'm saying. It's enough, right? It's enough. And she said herself, essentially, these are words Michelle Alexander would not have written just a short time ago. Is that a sign of the tide turning? We know it's not uniform, right? We know that the speech pathologist in Palestinian America, Bahi Maui, was fired from her job in Texas for refusing to adopt an anti-boycott pledge of Israel that was part of her contract. So, you know, let's not declare victory here. But there are powerful signs that speaking out, doing the work, not backing down, makes a difference. Just three examples for now. Just yesterday, just yesterday, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute reversed itself again. And after a tremendous outcry, probably including the, the uh, piece by Michelle Alexander, once again offered the Shuttlesworth Award to Dr. Angela Davis. And also recently, the city of West Hollywood reinstated its plans to screen the film 1948, Mabruk. By our honorees tonight, Dr. Ahlam Mutasib and Mr. Andy Trimlin, okay? And I am so sad, well, I'm, I'm going to be away, I'm going to be out of the country, my wife and I are gonna be out of the country, but I'm very sad that I won't be there with you. I really am. And then there is the work of Rebuilding Alliance, which has built into its organizational DNA as you've heard tonight, amplifying the voices of Palestine and Israeli peacemakers and their communities. And that construction, it's a beautiful thing to say, construction is the best response to destruction. Rebuilding Alliance speaks out for Palestinian families. You could hear like all the efforts they go to to get people out of Gaza to come and be witness for their own lives to speak truth to power, to speak truth to the right, the Palestinian right to a home, schooling, economic security, a group which ad advocates for a just and enduring peace in Palestine and Israel. A peace we can all agree that must be founded upon equal rights, equal security, equal opportunity for all, as they so eloquently say themselves. And this year, especially, Rebuilding Alliance is helping to amplify and honor the stories and storytellers of Palestine. And as I look around at family, friends, old friends, new friends, I can just only tell you, shukranik to you, and I'm very honored to be here tonight. <laughs>